I've been part of this health survey in Canada for years now. For every few years, uh, the government calls me up and they ask me questions about my health, my physical and my mental and my psychological health, trying to find me. I'm hiding from them. They ask me all kinds of questions. There's a series of questions they ask me that along this lines. They say, do you have anyone to talk to when you're sad? Do you have anyone who will take care of you when you're sick? It's several questions along that line, and then they'll ask me to, um, to specify us. Uh, is that none of the time, some of the time, most of the time, or they all the time? And I always answer these questions all of the time. I always have someone to be there with me all the time for the past 20 years. Eliana and I will be It'll be our 20th anniversary on August the 20th. Isn't that cool? That's right. And I cannot forget this year. So <laughs> help me remember. If you care for your pastor at all, you will just help him. Almost half my life I've been married to Eliana, so I'm not alone. And that's one of the many things I love about marriage. You know, after college, I lived one year by myself, and it was, I absolutely hated it. It was the worst year of my life. I, I would set up. To, I know you'll find this hard to believe, but I would go to different families in our churches every night for supper so I could be around, well, so I wouldn't have to cook, but also so I could be around uh, families as I just didn't like being myself. I was an awesome youth pastor, though, for that very reason, because I would drag kids with me everywhere as I went, and I would minister every night of the week, and I would always be going because I just hated going home alone by myself in my apartment. Worst year of my life. Got married, nine months later, had a kid. It's been great. 20 years ever since. It's no fun to be alone, is it? If you sleep alone or eat alone or go places alone or watch movies alone, everything's better with a friend. And it's really no fun when you're in trouble to be alone. That's when you really know you need someone to help you. When uh, Rick, Elia, and I were in Ecuador, a couple of nights a week, Tony went to a friend's house to spend the night. And Robbie said, do you know how big and creepy this house is at night by yourself? I had to sleep downstairs with Nugget. Because you know, our Chihuahua is a great source of protection. It's true, actually. He's kind of a demon dog, isn't he, Elliot? He would attack people, rip their jugulars out. But I understand that. I understood that because I'm sure many of you with Roberto would agree it's no fun to be alone. You know, God agrees with that too. He said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it is not good that the man be alone. I will make for him a helper suitable for him. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, uh, Solomon writes, two are better than one because they have good return on their labor. For if either of them falls, the other one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who falls and there is not another around to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. How many people know all about that? Their wife sticks cold feet on them. And yes, see, I, I, you know about that, don't you? How can they be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, who can resist him? A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. I'm sure David will agree with this, that it's no fun to be alone, because in 1 Samuel chapter 21, where we're going to be this morning, we find David alone. Let's turn over there. And let's read this passage, and then we'll look at the observations. Then David came to Nob, to Elimelech the priest, and Elimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone, and no one is with you? And David said to Elimelech the priest, The, the king has commissioned me with a matter, and has said to me, Let no one know anything about the matter which I am sending you on, and with which I have commissioned you. And I have directed the young men to a, uh, a, a certain place. Yeah, yeah, that's what I did. Now, therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can be found. The priest answered David and said, There is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. If only the young men had kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said to him, Well, surely women have been kept from us, as previously when I was sent out, and the vessels of the young men are holy. Though it were an ordinary journey, how much more then today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there, but the bread of presence, which was removed from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in his place when it was taken away. Now, 
One of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. David said to Elimelech, Now is there not a spear or sword on hand? For I brought neither sword nor weapon with me, because uh, the king's matter was urgent. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it, for there is no other except it here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. And David arose, and he fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands? Well, David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath, so he disguised his sanity before them. He acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the door of the gates and let saliva run down into his beard. And Achish said to the servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack med men that you have brought this one to act the mammon in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? Well, we see, you know about David that he grew up in a big family. And David's used to having brothers and family around. He's used to having people watch out for him. Once he started serving the king, everyone in the nation loved him. He had lots of attention. He was a leader, and there was men under his command that were ready to do whatever he ordered. He had a wife who loved him. His, he was best friends with Jonathan, the, ki the king's son. So this guy's well-connected. He's got people. He's got resources. But now he doesn't. And he shows up at Nob by himself. And it's obvious to Elimelech, the high priest, that something's not right with this picture. And he says to him, why are you alone? Why is there nobody with you? Why are you alone? That's a good question. Last week we talked about being a loyal friend and having loyal friends. We talked about loving and serving each other, and when you do these things, you draw people to yourself. Now, I would flip that logic around and propose to you, if you are not loving and serving others, chances are you are not a loyal friend, and you haven't been able to develop intimate relationships. Consequently, you are alone. I know a fellow who, in the past year, has managed to lose all of his relationships. His wife left him, his kids went to their mother, he has no work, despite the fact that he has been in this county for over 30 years. He's not developed any relationships with any employers that wanted to keep him on or keep him around. His own mother said to him, I'm done with you. I've got nothing left to give. That's pretty bad when you lose your mom's love, right? When your mom turns on you, you know you've messed up. Likewise, though we've tried to help him here in the past, he has burned bridges here. And the last time... We talked on the phone. He was living out of his truck. He had nothing, and he still couldn't get what I was trying to say to him when I was talking to him about faithfulness to God, commitment to coming to church, learning and changing and evaluating himself. He couldn't hear me. He just mumbled about how everyone abandoned him, and he was all alone. But being alone was a symptom wasn't it? It wasn't the problem. It was a symptom of bigger issues. Things he does which drives people away. And until those behaviors are addressed, that state of loneliness is going to continue. I find it quite telling when people fight and battle with others, they claim to love, and after they drive them away, they complain, they complain about being lonely and nobody loving them. However, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which I read often to many, many people, and we talk about it often around here, don't we? What does Corinthians say? Love is patient and love is kind and it is not jealous and it does not brag. It's not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not easily provoked. It does not keep records of wrong. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. hopes all things. It endures all things. And I tell them that definition of love and very little of that are they practicing how can you claim to love someone when you do the opposite of what defines love? 
You don't love them. You love you. And you want people to love you, but you aren't willing to actually engage in the act of loving. And that will wear people out. That will make them want to get away from you. My grandmother stayed with my grandfather for years. She, uh, he was an alcoholic. He was verbally and emotionally abusive. He wasn't all bad. He did have some very interesting qualities. And, you know, I'm sure there were things she could have did better and said better. And she, she had her own flaws, too. But she'd gotten sick, and her, she was tired of the fighting. So she eventually moved out and got into a little seniors complex, retirement complex, and left him in the home. What was sad is that he would call her every week. He got her number somehow. And he'd call her every week and tell her how much he loved her and beg her to come home. And then a half an hour later, he'd call her and curse her. So, you know. His words didn't really ring true. His actions did not match what he said. There was void in the meaning of his statement of love. So this is one part of the equation. Sometimes, something for us to think about is that we might be alone because of the toxic environment that we are creating that people can't live in. Now, the other side is that we may be alone because we have to walk away from someone who has created a toxic environment, such is the case with David, right? I mean, he had friends, he had family, he had a wife who loved him. He was leaving because his father-in-law was going to kill him. So David's loneliness here is not his fault, and perhaps your loneliness is not your fault. It would be convenient to simply apply David's scenario to ourselves. I'm just like David, you know, I'm alone because I'm the victim. Everyone else just hates me and they want to kill me. That would be simple and tidy, wouldn't it? Probably an overstatement. We have to honestly evaluate. Am I alone because people want to kill me if I stay or because maybe I'm doing something to drive people away? I suspect most of us, it's not a life and death situation. We may be unhappy. We might be dissatisfied. There might be some anger and bitterness. But probably most of us are not in a life and death. If you are, leave. I recommend you follow Dave's example there. Most of us are probably much like my grandparents, that uh, two sides and both parties uh, could work on it, but perhaps we're too stubborn to do our part. Why are you alone, David? The priest asks. And what does David say? He says, well, you know, the king has commissioned me in the matter, said to me, don't tell anyone what the matter is, how convenient. I'm sending you, on this commission to you, and I've, and I've directed the young man to, to go to a certain place. He didn't say the place, just, you know, a certain place, that's it, somewhere. What's David doing there? You think he's lying? Yeah. This is uh, very common. When you're alone, it's hard to trust. It's hard to open up. It's hard to tell the truth because often people are afraid, and I think David's afraid here. He needs some help, but he doesn't want to explain the situation. He's trying to, you know, fly low under the radar. He doesn't want Saul to know where he is, so he just lies to the priest. I'm not alone. Yeah, I, I've got men with me. They're, yeah, you know, someplace. And uh, we're on a secret, secret covert, uh, urgent mission. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Now, some commentaries interpret this passage that David said there was some men with him, so he did have some, in fact, have some men with him. He must have had a group. But I don't agree with that because none of the rest of the details in this passage indicates that he has any group of people with him. When you look at chapter 20, he was with Jonathan by himself and he was hiding by himself and then he left, right? And then when you see what happens in 21 where he goes to the Philistines, there's no mention of any other group. And he's acting crazy because he's scared, right? And he's, he's trying to, you know, get out of there without losing his head. So... Um, I, I, and then you see in verse chapter 22, that is when actually some guys come and join him. So right now, I think it, it's pretty clear that he was alone and he was just lying. Now, sometimes we will see people in Scripture who do things wrong, like lying about stuff, and we are tempted to conclude, well, because of the situation, and because we know David's the good guy, it was okay for David to lie. It was necessary because he was in a tight spot. And the answer to that rationalization is no. No, that's not what this is teaching us. 
It's not okay to lie. This is, nar- this is a narrative passage, historical literature, recording the facts, not telling you do this, just this is what happened. So even though it worked at the moment, it does not work out for the best. And we're going to learn that when we get into chapter 22 next week. Elimelech and the priest and their families all get slaughtered because they helped David. Well, well, that wasn't David's fault. He didn't slaughter them. Yes, but at least had they known the truth, then they would have had the opportunity to decide, do I want to risk my life? And they didn't get any choice at all in that. Maybe they would have helped him anyways, maybe not. David's lie, though, my point is, is David's lie has some unintended consequences. Likewise, our lies, which often we tell for our own good or somebody else's own good, may have unforeseen unintended consequences. Ah, I don't want my wife to know about this. Eh, It'll only hurt her. It's going to make a big mess. Let's just avoid this drama. We'll sweep this under the rug. Maybe it'll all go away. Usually it doesn't go away, does it? Usually it all comes out and it creates more drama. And we end up with unintended consequences. If you're lying to yourself about why you're alone, without a doubt, you're just prolonging your state of loneliness. Blaming everyone else and not admitting your part is just keeping you stuck in the same crazy cycle. You know what a crazy cycle is? You do the same thing over and over and expect different results, but it doesn't work that way. It just keeps working out the same way. That's a crazy cycle. David lies because he needs something. What does he need? He needs food. What else? He needs a weapon. I think that right there should have been an indication to the priest that he was lying. I mean, what captain of the guard goes anywhere without a weapon? And furthermore, who, what guy would go on a journey without a lunch? I mean, I don't even come up to work for the day without packing a lunch. If I was going on a journey, we go grocery shopping. We make snacks and lunches and meals. It's like, you know, hey, are we going to stop at a restaurant? What? Of course not. We're not wasting money there. We're going to pack a lunch. Takes up the whole car, but it's worth it. I'd venture to say, probably David doesn't even have any money. I mean, you think about it. He took off in a panic, right? He doesn't have a weapon. Probably didn't have any money either. When we make knee-jerk emotional decisions, we rarely have time to plan or think through all that we're going to need, and then we find ourselves in desperate situations. Now, when we used to live in Toronto, Nova Scotia, our church was the first church that you would find when you came off the highway as you drove into the town. So what would that would mean is that a few times a year, we would have hitchhikers or even people with cars coasting into town on fumes, and they all had the same story. I'll tell you the story right here. They were from Newfoundland, and they were trying to get to Toronto because they had a buddy who had a job for them, or they had a relative there who was going to get them a job. And so they had gotten across here at the ferry, and they were stuck here, and they just needed some money so they could get. Or it was the other way. They were in Toronto, and they were trying to get home to Newfoundland. They were trying to get home, and they got this far, and they were running out of gas, or they ran out of food, or they ran out of smokes. And uh, you could tell they never came in. They are always in a desperate situation. You know what you, happens when you see someone in a desperate situation? It, it just compels you to want to help, doesn't it? You just want to help. And And the two people in this story, David who's lying and Elimelech who's helping, probably Elimelech's the guy that we should learn from, right? We should say, well, you know, he's being a good countryman. I think that if we were ever going to err, it would be better to err on the side of helping people, of being too generous as opposed to being too stingy. If the worst thing someone would say about you is that you helped to your own detriment, that you gave too much, well... At least you erred in honor, trying to honor God's word and do something pos- uh, positive. You erred trying to help. The priest, he <laughs> gives. But, you know, this isn't just some newfie coming off the side of the road here either. I mean, this is the king's son-in-law, right? This is David the war hero, the guy who slayed Goliath. Matter of fact, we happen to have the very sword that you took off Goliath right here. David has as much right to that sword as anyone, right? That would be logical. So David's like, yeah, I'll take that. And he gets what he needs, and he rolls out, and he thinks he got away scot-free. 
But then the author gives us a little detail that you need to hang on to. Did you catch it in verse 7? Just out of the blue, it says, oh, by the way, there was a servant of Saul there detained for the Lord. His name was Doig, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherd. And just remember him. File that back there. We're going to meet him again sometime soon. But for now, David leaves Israel. And it says in verse number 2, he fled that day from Saul and went to Achish of Gath. And Gath is, of course, one of the cities of the Philistine Empire, right? It's, it's now, he's leaving the country and going into the Philistine territory. Uh, he thinks he's going to be safer there. But, as we noticed, it only makes matters worse. Because, at least in Israel, they've got the customs of hospitality, and he's got family, and he's got people that admire him, and... Uh, He's really only got to stay away from one guy, right? I mean, everyone else kind of likes David, but he's got to stay away from Saul. But when he goes to the Philistine territory, he's got no friends, no allies. He's carrying the weapon of their great fallen hero. That's maybe wasn't such a wise choice after all. He's, uh, he's famous because he's killed thousands of their countrymen. Pretty hard to hide when you're public enemy number one, right? They even, they even, he's so infamous, they think he's the king of Israel. Did you catch that? Where they said, is this not David, the king of the land? He, they equated him to being, you know, the ruler of Israel. And so he's in a lot, he's, he's out of the frying pan into the fire here as he goes over to uh, Gath. David has to think on his feet and he realizes, uh-oh, I'm in a lot of trouble here. So what does he do? What does he do? He acts crazy, doesn't he? In order to survive, being by himself, he feels he needs to lie, and he has to, he feels the need to act crazy. You know who keeps me from doing lots of crazy stuff? You could say it, it's okay. Your wife, yeah. Jason, you feel me on that one, don't you, right? You got the same problem, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, my wife keeps me from doing lots of crazy stuff. My family, good friends. They give me sound advice. They steer me in the right direction. We look at people who do really crazy things and we wonder, what is wrong with them? Why do they act like that? Sometimes it's because they're alone and they have nobody to help balance them, to advise them, to tell them to stop acting like an idiot. Sometimes you have to love someone enough to tell them that you are being a big idiot. If you've got friends who will confront you and tell you you're wrong, don't get angry at them and walk away from them. They are your good friends. Most people don't like confrontation, and they will avoid it as much as possible. And for a friend to actually step up and confront you and tell you you're wrong means they probably really do care a lot about you. If they didn't, they would just ignore you and leave you by yourself. Sometimes you've got to be firm and you've got to tell people that their behavior is not acceptable. Lots of young people are growing up with nobody to tell them their behavior is not acceptable, so they really don't know how to conduct themselves. They dress or they look or they act or they talk crazy. They're screaming for attention or they're doing stuff deliberately to push people away from them. They're... Maybe they've gotten hurt by the people that were close to them. So they do crazy things to sever those relationships. It's a defense mechanism. It's intended to keep people away because they're afraid of getting hurt. That's exactly what David's doing, isn't he? He's pretending to be crazy so that they will leave them alone. And actually, in the Philistine culture, the Philistines believed that people who were insane that was a result of a specific act of God. They assumed that that crazy person had contact with the deity and they felt, we need to just leave them alone. So they feared madness and because of their superstitions, they just would keep a distance from crazy people. And that's really all that David wanted, wasn't it? He wanted the Philistines to leave him alone. So he's doing this crazy thing on the door and he's letting spit run down his beard and that was a clear sign because, you know, as Robert will tell you, the beard is a, very, is a very manly thing, isn't it, Robert? It's very honoring to have a beard. It's in this Philistine culture, your manhood, and, and it was honorable. And to let 
you know, something defile your beard or to spit on yourself, they would never, ever, that would be ridiculous to think about doing something like that. So that would be a great dishonorable thing. So you'd have to be crazy to just uh, drool all over yourself. And, uh, you know, that's exactly what David wanted. They left him alone, and it works for the moment. But at the end of the day, David is still alone. And he really needs some help here. We, too, need to recognize just because someone is looking or acting very weird, just because they're putting up walls with their behavior to keep people out, doesn't mean we ought to stay away. It means that we should work harder to love them and help them. We'll have to take down those walls with patience and with kindness. We'll have to search harder to find people and bring them, help lead them out of that state of loneliness. It's no fun to be alone. Do you agree? We all know that. We all should see when someone is alone and recognize that's not good for them. And chances are they really probably don't want to be that way. Perhaps they just need some help making some friends. They need some help connecting with people. Maybe they're afraid. They need people. Maybe they've been hurt. And they need people to extend some help and some love and to make some room and give them a chance. We can never say, I've got enough friends already, thank you very much. I have no time in my place for other people. No, we can never, ever have too many friends. And as long as there are people who need love, we can't leave them alone. We can't. Aren't you glad that God doesn't leave you alone? Aren't you glad he didn't leave you? Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is, that's right, he's with you. Wherever you go, Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will not leave you as orphans in the world, Jesus promised. I will send the Comforter. I will send the Holy Spirit. What can separate us from the love of God, Paul asked, rhetorical question. And then he answers, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, things present, things to come, height or depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Christ Jesus our Lord. Not leaving people alone is, in fact, acting like who? Acting like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're here today, and you think you're alone, you don't have to. Because of these promises, God has promised to be with you. All you have to do is open up to him. You have to let your walls down. You have to ask him to come into your life. You have to talk to him and listen to him. But Jesus will be there. Did did you hear that promise in Revelation where he said, Behold, I will stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open the door, I will come in and I will be with him. I will sup with him. I will dine with him. That's a great thing, a great um, picture of fellowship in the New Testament, that that culture, that you would eat with somebody. And I agree with that. I love people taking me for lunch or we get to do lunch. It's just a blessing to eat with people. But that is the relationship that God offers each and every one. Jesus offers you today to be with you. Maybe there's someone here today who feels alone, has been separated from God, separated from people, needs to evaluate why that is. Start by opening up to the Lord. Open up to the Holy Spirit. Open up to Jesus. Let him in. Let him make a change. And then open up to people. Learn to love like we learned last week. Learn to be a loyal friend. Let's let's bow. Every head bow, every eye closed. If you're here today, you're lonely today, open up to Jesus. Open up to God. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. I need help. I'm alone. I'm crazy, I'm lying about things, I've got walls up, I'm hurting, I don't want to stay like this. Help change me. Ask him to come in. Ask him to speak to you. He will. He can make the changes in your life. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you have spoken to someone this morning. Someone has heard your 
knocking and that they will open up and let you in. Be filled with your love. Be filled with your compassion and be filled with your joy and your peace and that it will fill them to the brim and overflowing that will flow out of their lives to reach and touch others. And maybe we're here today and maybe we've got everything all nice and organized. We've got friends and family. But Lord, help us to be so full of love that it will flow and we will draw a larger circle around more people and say, who else needs love? Who else needs a touch? Who else needs to be served? And may we be always diligent to reach out to hurting people, to find them, and to show them your love. Lord, we pray that your presence will be with us each and every day. We pray in Jesus' name.